morning and welcome to Crossroads. We're so glad you've chosen to join to worship with us today. Whether it be online or in person, we're glad you're here. If you are joining us online, just know that you can still keep up to date with us by checking out our website. There you can find out more about Crossroads, watch current and past sermons, and you can give online and more. If you have the Church Center app, you can also give there as well. Also, if you're a visitor with us today, stop by one of our welcome tables, and if you haven't already, speak with one of our greeters. They would love to give you a gift. Now let's stand for the reciting of scripture. Philippians 2 verses 9 through 11 say, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And the church says, Amen. Let's worship. Good morning, church. We're so glad that you joined us in worship. So let's lift our voices this morning. This is the day. This is the day that you have made. Whatever comes, I won't come.
morning. He's worthy. Amen. God is so good. And he's worthy to be praised. I say he's worthy to be praised because as we look at our lives, we know that it took God to transform us from who we used to be. Amen? Or he's, ta he's taking a sweet time to show us who we should become through him. And he's worthy of that because the things... I can speak for myself. If I didn't have the Lord in my life, you will find a very vulgar, 
a very vulgar person, needing of Christ, and will be living a very different lifestyle. And that's the real of it. But he poured out his love and he poured out his grace upon me to show me different. And he's covered me through so many things. And so I say he's worthy because he is. And that's all he needs. That's the, that's the, that's the only thing he needs is that, God, you're worthy. Whether we know that or not, and we haven't come to that place in ourselves, sometimes we just got to place the worthy there and say it belongs to you, God. Show me who you are in this moment. Show me who you are in my life, God. Show me how good you are. And we've asked those things, and he's shown us. So this morning as we sing, let's remember that he's worthy and that he is good and that he's been there from the beginning. Amen? Let's sing.
you that even when you don't, we don't deserve it, you are so good to us. God, I pray that um, the message that you're bringing us today will just touch us in ways that we need this week. God, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Morning, church. Hey, it is good to see you. I'm glad you're here. Uh, if you're a visitor, just checking things out, uh, we're glad that you're here to celebrate Jesus with us. If you're watching online, we're glad that you are here as well. Uh, as a church, it's our vision to connect people to Jesus and love our community. Uh, over the past several weeks, we've had some exciting ways to connect people to Jesus. Uh, one of those was this past week at VBS. Uh, that hopefully some of you have recovered from or are in the process of. Uh, but we had a great week at VBS around here. Uh, I know that a lot of us are tired, but uh, if you weren't here, weren't able to join us, there was 200 kids throughout the course of the week uh, that showed up here at different times. Uh, and on top of the kids, there was 130 volunteers, uh, which was absolutely incredible. The first night, the first night of VBS, uh, we, had, we had a great number of kids, but we had more volunteers the first night than we did kids. Uh, and, and that almost never happened. So that was <laughs> extremely exciting, uh, especially if you hung out with the kids that were here. Uh, we needed all the volunteers that we could. So uh, if you help make VBS possible in any way, I am so thankful for you and your willingness to do that. Uh, the other way uh, that we have been able to connect some people to Jesus is through our high school trip out to NYR. Uh, and so our students had a great trip. I mentioned that last week. Uh, but we have a video uh, of uh, some of their stories of what God was doing uh, that we're going to show to kind of keep us updated uh, as far as uh, some of the ways that they were able to connect to Jesus out there. Hi, I'm Alicia Brands, and I'm going into my junior year. Hey, I am Joe Scanlon. I'm a making graduate. My name is Hope Stewart. I'm going to be going into year 11th grade. Joe, what's been your favorite part of NYR so far? Getting to be outside um, while I worship God, because then I get to see his creations everywhere and get to be in nature, while I also get to learn more about him and um, get to be closer to him. What is something that God taught you this week? That you just need to take it one step at a time. Um, a lot of times I find myself taking it a little bit too far with planning, like two weeks ahead or a week ahead, etc. that I need to just take it one step at a time. Well, what's, what's something that you have learned this week that you're gonna take back home with you? I learned that Jesus helps most people whenever they need it. Those are just a few of the stories, and you'll hear more of those in the upcoming weeks. Today, we're continuing our series, Summer Stories, looking at some of the best short stories uh, told in all of history. They're known as the parables. And, and as Jesus tells these stories, they're not just stories that have a happy or fairy tale ending. They're st stories that introduce us to a new kingdom and invite us into a new way of living. And these stories, they breathe hope. They expose our insecurities and our worries and our faults. They teach us about the kingdom of Jesus. And what I love about these stories is they give us, as Jesus teaches and as he tells these stories, they give us an idea of what the finished product is supposed to look like. But it also challenges us to use our brains and our creativity in order to create it. 
So far in this series, we've looked at uh, the, the parable of the mustard seed, the story about a small mustard seed that grows into something big. And we talked about how God has to grow in us before he can grow around us. Last week, we talked about uh, the story, the parable of the talents. And we talked about the gifts that God gives us, that everything is his, and that what we do today in his kingdom makes a difference in our faith tomorrow. But if we hear these stories, you know, if we listen to these stories, we hear them, but we don't do anything with them, is it really that good of a story? If we listen to the story about this mustard seed and what it teaches us about how God wants to grow us, and we don't do anything with it, we don't trust a little bit more, is it that good of a story? If we hear this story about the parable of the talents and the way that God gives good gifts and the way that he takes care of us and that everything that he gives us is his, but we don't manage our finances any different, is it that good of a story? Like if we hear the story but change nothing in our lives, is it, is it really that good of a story? And is it the story or is it the hearer? Let's play suppose. Suppose you go to a restaurant and you sit down and you open up the menu. And you're not, you're not sure what you want. It's a new restaurant. Okay? You're not sure what you want. You sit down you start to look at the menu and you realize that something on the appetizer menu looks absolutely incredible. You're like, oh man, before I can decide on dinner, I have got to get that. You know, and so you decide, okay, we're getting that appetizer, and by we, I mean I, but I'll say we to make it sound better, okay, but I'm not really planning on sharing it, okay? We're going to get that appetizer, and then you decide on what you're going to order for your main dish, and so the waiter or waitress, they come, and they take your order and say, I need this appetizer, and then I'd like this for dinner, and everybody else that you're with, they order around the table, and Pretty soon they, everybody, you know, gets their drinks and pretty soon they bring out your appetizer and they set it down in front of you like, oh, this is, this looks good. And just like you had kind of hoped, you share it with no one, that you just take care of this appetizer yourself and it tastes so good, it's enjoyable. And then they come, they clean up your plate and you start drinking your sweet tea and by the time the entree gets there, there's been enough time for both your stomach and your brain to realize, I'm kind of full. And so the waiter or waitress, they set, their, they set your entree down in front of you, and you look at it, and you know, because I have enjoyed that appetizer and my sweet tea so much, I'm kind of full. You think, but I can't let this whole meal just go to waste. So you kind of take a couple bites, and you realize it will be too uncomfortable for me to eat this whole meal. I can't do it. I can't eat this meal because the appetizer was too good. The sweet tea was too good. I I can't eat this whole meal. And I I don't think that this hypothetical situation is that hard to grasp because we do it all the time probably. The waiter or waitress comes around and they look around the table and everybody else who didn't have an appetizer, they have finished their meal and then they kind of glance over in your direction and say, are we going to need any boxes tonight? You take a box and you put your food in it and you take it home with great aspirations. And some of us are going to eat it for lunch the next day. And some of us are going to put it in our fridge until we realize it's time to throw it out and then throw it out. We miss the meal. And when it comes to us understanding the word of God, we play out the same exact scenario. We miss the entire meal. Because we've just enjoyed the snacks on Sunday. We miss the best part about the word of God because we only take in what happens in this room and nothing throughout the week. We miss the entree, life-changing power of the word of God because we are settling for a snack on Sunday morning. And Jesus, as he tells a story this morning, he teaches us why that is. He challenges what is happening in our lives that prevents us from enjoying the whole meal. In all through Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this story shows up in every one of the accounts of Jesus' life. It's not in John. 
Everyone, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it shows up in that story. We're going to read the story from the book of Matthew in Matthew chapter 13. Jesus tells the parable, and then later on, we'll skip down to it, he actually explains it. Matthew chapter 13 says, The same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such a large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he scattered his seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and withered, because they had no roots. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on the good soil, which had produced a crop, a hundred 60 or 30 times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let him hear. And we're going to skip down to verse 18 when he explains it. He says, listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes out and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they only last a short time. When trouble or persecution come up because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling along the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on the good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. You see, Jesus was speaking to an agricultural town. The crowd would have connected deeply to this illustration of farming. It would have been something that they see all the time, in many ways similar to us. We see it around us all the time. However, as Jesus tells this story, there are some subtle differences that play an enormous part in our understanding of this story. As Jesus tells the story, we gain a little bit of understanding about what their culture was like when it comes to farming compared to ours. If next spring, if you were driving through town and you were following a tractor with a planter on it, and as you drove through town, you quickly realized that the entire way through town on the highway, they were throwing seed everywhere. You would probably have a few questions, right? Right? First question is, what on earth are they doing? You would have some realizations of, this guy might not make it too long in the farming world. You would have questions of, why are they planting seed on the highway? Why are they throwing seed where they haven't prepared for it to grow? You see, it wouldn't make any sense. You see, for you and me, we're used to seeing fields be prepared to be planted and then planted. Where seed is thrown, where it is prepared to be planted, to where it will yield the best crop. Farmers take care of field. They understand the nutrients and the, where it is rich and where it will grow and how it will grow. And then seed is planted in those plants, places after the ground is ready to take the seed. In Jesus' day, however... In Jesus' day, a farmer with either uh, like a satchel or depending on how much he had to plant, maybe uh, big bags on the back of a donkey or an ox, would by hand take handfuls of seed and throw it everywhere. They would throw it everywhere and they operated with the mindset that the more seed, the bigger crop. The more seed, the bigger crop. Because what they did is they would throw seed and then they would turn the soil. They didn't know what was going to be rich, good soil until after it was turned. And so if the seed was only thrown in certain places, but good soil was someplace else, they would miss out on that harvest. And so when the farmer here that Jesus is illustrating, what they would have understood, they understand a, a farmer that throws seed everywhere because when it is tilled, sometimes in the least likely places is the richest soil for growth. The more seed the better the harvest. You see, here's what the sower does. And friends, we cannot miss this in our understanding of what Jesus is teaching. When we see the sower, the sower gives every soil a chance to produce. 
The sower gives every soil a chance to produce. Jesus, he gives us an understanding of these soils. When he first tells the story, some seed, as it's thrown, it falls on the path. And as it's as it's thrown onto the path, Jesus tells us that birds, or in one of the other Gospels, it says Satan snatches it up. It snatches it up. There's, there's no place for it to grow. Then there's the rocky ground, where the plant might grow, but there's no soil. It's shallow, and so as soon as there's some sun, it just burns up. Then there's the thorns and the weeds. And this is not... This is not a quick death. It's that the seed that's thrown grows alongside the weeds or the thorns. And eventually, eventually those weeds and those thorns choke out the plant that they were wanting to grow. And then there's the good soil. The good soil was the nutrient-rich soil. This is what produced growth where you can see a harvest and most of the stories that we read together we read them and then we're supposed to kind of figure out what Jesus is teaching the parable of the sower though is different because Jesus explains it which we read together he explains what each part of this looks like but what we need to understand is as he's telling this story the seed the seed is the word of God in this story, that's what the seed represents, the word of God. And so the word of God is thrown out. The soil, the soil is you and me. And the sower is God. And so as God is throwing out his word, where it lands is further explained. You see, when it lands on the path, it lands on Places or people that want nothing to do with the Word of God. They're turned off by it. Their hearts are hardened to it. They don't want any accountability to it. They don't want to be told what to do, how to do, when to do it. Have no desire whatsoever. And they see it as no priority in their lives. They are in control of their life and they don't want anything else put into it. The rocky ground. The rocky ground, this is the quick transformation Maybe you've known someone that all of a sudden they showed up at church, they loved Jesus, they gave their lives to Jesus, they followed Jesus for like two weeks, and then something hard happened in life. All of a sudden there was accountability to their decision, and then the next week it's like, yeah, I tried that Christian thing, it didn't really work out for me. And they're like, what just happened? Like you were all on board two weeks ago, and now you want nothing to do with it. Well, all of a sudden, now there's accountability. Now all of a sudden, there's difficulty that we have to persevere through. And now I don't want anything to do with that. Where we grow up real quick, and then it's done. Maybe some of us have even had experiences like that in our life. Where we had this really great God experience, and it changes for like two weeks. And all of a sudden, life happened, and we're like, ah, maybe not. Kind of fall into the same patterns and routines. And then there's... The thorns and the weeds. And this is where the word of God goes out. And it's heard and it's understood. And it begins to grow in our lives, but it grows alongside aspects of this world. Whereas the word of God grows up in our life. Worry stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with worship. Where the love of money is the same, lives in the same house as the love of God. Where the pleasures of the world are just as big a priority as the person of God in our lives. Where it's growing alongside. And eventually the pleasures of the world and the joys of our money, they choke out what God is wanting to do. And then there's the good soil. You see, the good soil is where we hear the word of God. And it changes our life where we become more like Jesus in everyday life. Where we hear the word of God teach on forgiveness. And then we begin to extend forgiveness to people in unexpected places. But where we hear the responsibilities of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And then we take on those responsibilities in our life. The good soil where it begins to produce life change inside of us. And when it comes to this story that Jesus teaches... 
It's real easy to read this story and begin to think, well, this person's this type of soil, and this person is this type of soil, and I'm this type of soil. We begin to throw the labels that Jesus gives us on people as well as ourselves. And we think to ourselves, well, I'm probably the good soil. And, I mean, you know, my, my friend over here, they're, they're the rocky soil. It's kind of shady. And we begin to throw labels on who we are and who others are in our lives. But, friends, if we're honest with ourselves, when it comes to reading these stories, we can't label each other because each and every one of us have each of these aspects of soil in our lives. We like to maybe focus on the best, but the truth is is that all of these soils live in the garden of our life. Because when it comes to the soil, the soil is basically the same. The difference in the soil is what has been added to them. And so the question is not, what type of soil am I? The question that we need to begin to ask ourselves is, where in my life am I not allowing God to grow? Where in my life have I shut out his word because I don't want the accountability of it? It's not what type of one soil am I. They all reside inside of us. It's in my life. Where is God's word not growing? Because I have not allowed it to. As I was reading this story this week, trying to connect it to where we live and the culture that we live in, most of the time I have always read and looked at the different types of soil, because that's what Jesus illustrates. That's what he points out. But friends, you and I, we live in a culture that doesn't necessarily pay attention to the soil because it's so busy trying to change the seed. You and I, we live in a world that is not taking Jesus' word and transforming the soil in our lives. You and I, we live in a culture We live in a culture that is recognizing the soil that is enjoyable and then changing the seed to fit the soil. But the truth is, God's word doesn't need to change to fit us. We fit God's circumstances. We change our lives to fit God's truth. When we begin to change the truth of God's word to fit our circumstances, we have lost the love for Jesus. And we're just searching for a religion to make us feel less guilty. God is not asking us to write his words. He's asking us to live his words. Well, I mean, man, I I, I read God's word, but I just don't really feel it. I I read God's word, and it doesn't really, it doesn't change anything. I mean, I spend all this time reading these words, and it doesn't change. And if I could ask the question, maybe it's not what we're reading that's the issue. Maybe it's the condition of the soil. Maybe it's the way that those words are falling on our lives. Maybe it's time for us to look at the soil of who we are as to why God's word is not resonating and growing. Are we humble? Are we submissive? Are we open to learning? Are we willing to change? Are we repentant of the things that we have done wrong or even willing to recognize them? Are we conditionally reading just the parts we want to hear? Are we telling God where we're going to grow? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, The word of God is alive and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates even the dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. You see, the word of God is alive. It is alive, and it is meant to transform our worldly lives to be more like Jesus. We can't expect God to grow in us if we're not willing to pull the rocks and the weeds out of our lives and throw them to the side. But when Jesus tells this story, the biggest difference in the soils is the fruitfulness. There's only one, there's only one soil that produces a harvest, which means there's really only one soil that produces healthy growth. 
The difference in the soil is the fruitfulness. It's what God is growing in us. Right now in your life, right now in your life, what is different in your life today than last week, than last month, than a year ago, than five years ago? What is it that God has grown in your life where there is fruitfulness, where you can see something growing, something changing, priorities shifting? What is it that God has grown in your life that is noticeably different because it has taken root and it has transformed? And friends, if I'm going to be honest, there are some of us, there are some of us that we pride ourselves in our good soil. Like our lives look like Jesus. Our behavior, it looks like Jesus. It looks good. Our church attendance is perfect. Our willingness to volunteer at times, spot on. And so our lives look like good soil. But there's nothing growing. What good is it to have a good soil that looks the part that's not growing anything in our lives that looks like Jesus? What good is just having good soil? If you talk to any of the farmers that are around us, and every year they just talk about how good their soil was. Man, my dirt looks great this year. They were like, oh, man, you know, how did it turn out last year? Well, I didn't get anything in the ground, but, man, my dirt looks good. And then the next year, you have the same conversation. Man, the dirt looks good this year. How, how did it work out for you last year? I mean, you know, was it a good harvest? Well, I didn't get anything in the ground. But, man, the dirt was good. Looked good, tested good. It was ready. See, the greatest indicator of good soil is something growing in it. When it comes to the kingdom of Jesus, when it comes to us taking on God's word, the greatest indicator of God's word in someone's life is life change that is growing. In our lives, in our lives, what is growing that is different than it was before because God's word has taken root. But you know the best part of this story? As good as God's word is, it's not the best part of the story. And, and as hopeful, even as God tells the story about the soils, it's not the best part of the story. You see, the best part of the story for you and me when Jesus tells it is the sower. I read several times this week, different preachers or authors saying, well, this should really be called the parable of the soil because that's what's talked about most. And if we went by what's written about most, then yes, that would be true. But the best part of the story that Jesus is telling is not the soil and it's not the seed, it's the sower. Because when you see and look at what the sower does, it communicates to you and me the God that we are following. I love the way that one author said it. He said, this story is a description of God. God knows it is foolish to spread seed to unworthy soil, but yet he does it anyway. God spreads his love with reckless abandon in hearts that are at once all four different types of soil. He throws seed at the disciples who over and over and over again prove that they have hard hearts and dim minds. Jesus continues to throw seed at them and continues to work with them, continues to help them see what God is up to in the world around them. He scatters the seed of the gospel with wild extravagance, even when it is clear that his disciples don't get it. When they turn him over to authorities, when they abandon him, and they deny him. 
Jesus continues to pour out his love on them, inviting them back after the resurrection. God is downright foolish in his love for you and me who continue to prove that we are hard-hearted, stubborn, and selfish. He continues to throw his love on us who seek morals and stories more than him. He continues to lavish his love on us who continue to ignore his call to action, who neglect to build his kingdom instead of focusing on building ourselves. You see, the best part of the story is not the seed and it's not the soil. It's the God who is throwing it. You see, God gives everyone a chance to thrive. When we read this story, it's not just that he threw the seed on the good soil. He gives each and every one of us in his kingdom a chance to thrive. You and I, we like to see the worst in ourselves oftentimes. But God? God sees the place in our life that could become the good soil to where growth can really happen. While we see the worst in us, God sees the one space of good soil that his word can transform and begin to change and bring life and hope to you and me. We can learn all day long about how to behave right, but if we aren't willing to surrender our lives to God, we will miss out on the entire meal of his goodness. Scripture teaches us While we were at our worst, Christ died for us. Not when we had pulled all the weeds and kicked all the rocks out of our life. But when they were there, when the sin and selfishness was present, that's when God threw his grace on us. That's when he lavished his love, as Scripture tells us. That's when he throws his seed of good news into our lives. You see, in God's kingdom, everyone has a chance to thrive. Where is it in our lives where we're not allowing God's word to thrive? Right now in our house, Jack and Maggie are in this habit of when it comes time to dinner, for dinner time, they eat, and I I imagine I'm not the only parent in the room, they eat the least amount of food possible to be done with dinner. And it drives you insane. Because I feel like at this point in my life, if this preaching gig doesn't work out, I'm going to become a hostage negotiator. Dad, how many bites do I need to eat? You need to eat all of them. Well, what if I only eat 10 bites? You need to eat all the bites so we take so many bites. Dad, how many bites, how many more bites do I need to have? You need to eat all the bites on your plate. But Dad, I don't want it. I know. Back and, back and forth, back and forth. And every once in a while, Dad, how many bites do I need to take? You need to take six more bites. Fully knowing as a dad, there's only three bites left on the plate, right? Unashamed. But sometimes, sometimes there'll be ten bites left on the plate. Dad, how many bites, how many more bites do I have to have? I don't like it. You know, the sob story. Three more bites of meat. Okay. Three more bites of meat. I know, and Emily know. we know right now that their appetite is to eat the least amount of food possible to move on to what they want to do. But when we're preparing dinner, we don't prepare the least amount that they might want. You see, their behavior doesn't change how we prepare. We still prepare the meal like they're going to eat a full portion. Not surprised when they don't. When it comes to the way we prepare the full meal, we prepare for them to eat a full meal. Even knowing that their behavior says they're only going to eat minimal bites in order to get on to what they want. And friends, when it comes to our lives, and when it comes to our lives, and the God that created us, God knows our behavior. He knows our willingness to accept his word. He knows our selfishness. He knows all the things that we want. But our behavior does not change his preparation of grace. 
our behavior does not change him being the sower. He does not throw less seed because sometimes we do what we want. He doesn't throw less seed of his good word into our lives because sometimes our lives are filled with selfishness and we're just trying to get to the next thing. God in heaven who knows each and every one of us in all the details of our lives. He does not change his preparation of heaven and an invitation of grace because of our behavior. The best part of the story is the sower. Because the sower, the sower gives every one of us a chance to thrive in his kingdom. And that is good news. Let me pray for us. Father, God, you know us so much better than we know ourselves. And God, your kingdom is so much better than we realize. Father, I know that there are places in our lives, each and every one of us, God, there are places in our life that are like the path where right now we, we don't want you. We don't want your truth. We don't want your accountability in your way because it's enjoyable the way that we're doing it. God, Satan has convinced us of another truth and snatched your goodness away. Father, there's some of us in our lives, all of us in our lives, that there's places that are like the rocky ground. God, where we're not growing, we're just making quick decisions that might look good on the surface, but they don't transform and grow roots in our life. God, there's some of us, all of us, that in our lives we have weeds and thorns that are growing up. God, they're bringing worry and clutter to our lives. God, they're bringing greed and selfishness. We're having a hard time seeing where you're at because there's so much of the world absorbed into our lives as well. And God, there's places in our lives that are good soil where you are growing, where you are transforming, where you are bringing hope. Father, I pray this morning that you will burden us with a desire to pull weeds and to kick out rocks. God, to allow your word to transform us in ways that we're not even sure or what to expect. Father, I'm so incredibly grateful that you continue to throw seed into the places of our life where it might seem foolish because you know us better than we know us. God, in your goodness and in your grace, you throw the goodness of your word into our lives in hopes that it might transform and bring hope. God, I pray that that happens this morning. God, I pray that your spirit moves in this room and those that are hearing the word as you it is said in your story, he who has ears, let him hear. God, let us hear. Let your spirit speak truth into us. And God, help us to get out of the way. God, I'm thankful you are who you are. That you see the good in us when we see the worst. God, you see the good moments when we see the angry moments. You see the good that you created in us when we see the sin. You see the good when we see the guilt. God, you see the good when we see the broken relationships. God, you see the good when we see the greed. God, I'm thankful that our behavior does not change your preparation of grace.
that you pour out on us. Jesus, help us to live in that grace. Help us to surrender to that grace. To live a life that is a reflection of you. God, that no matter who it is in this room right now, Father, that we will see you. God, we will love you. We will surrender to you. Because you give us a chance in your kingdom, as flawed and broken as we might be, a chance to thrive. The question is, where in our lives do we need God's word to grow? Where in our lives are we not allowing it to grow? See, God, when when he sees us, he doesn't see all those mistakes that we like to see, that we know about. He sees us as rescued. Because God knows that his son went to the cross to pay the price for all of those mistakes. That's why when we come together as a church, we have this unique time of community together where we remember the sacrifice of Jesus. Where we take communion together. Where we take a piece of bread and some juice and it reminds us, those emblems, they remind us of the body and the blood of Jesus that was shed for us where he paid that price for our sin and invites us into grace. And while that is an individual conversation, it's also a corporate experience. That God created his church together to be reminded about his grace. Together to learn to follow Jesus. And so here in just a moment, we're going to take communion together. And around the room at all of the lamps are some tables. And on the tables, there's a double stack of cups. The bottom cup is the bread. The top cup is the juice. And here in just a minute, whenever you're ready, we want to invite you to stand up and find a table close to you and grab some communion. And you can take it right there at the table and throw your cups in the trash. You can take it back to your seat and throw the cups out as you leave. As we remember the sacrifice of Jesus, we recognize that part of that sacrifice is calling us to live different. Where is it that God's word needs to begin to grow in my life? But also, also as we take communion together, Let it be a time of together. If you're sitting with your family, maybe you take communion and you pray together as a family. Or maybe you're sitting with your spouse and you you pray together as a couple before you take communion. Maybe you're just here with a group of friends and it's a together experience. Last week, man, last week, it was the first week we transitioned to kind of take communion like this instead of just at our seats. And I loved watching around the room. Families praying together, friends encouraging one another, hugs being given. I had one lady after services last Sunday come up to me and said, Matt, communion this week for my family was life-changing because we were able to do it together. As we take communion, Jesus died for each of us individuals, but he also rescued his church. And so as we take communion, let it be a time where you remember the sacrifice of Jesus, the way that he has called you to serve and grow in his kingdom. But also as we take communion, let it be a time where we do it together, where we pray for one another, encourage one another, stand alongside one another, and learn to follow Jesus together. Whenever you're ready, you're welcome to stand up, find communion, and we'll worship together in a few moments.
Senhor, te estendo graças.
it comes to taking these words home, the question for each of us is not which soil am I? The question is where in my life do I need to allow God's word to begin to grow? It's not going to be this harvest overnight, but it, it, it can begin to grow. But where is it where God's word needs to become a priority in my life more than it is in one aspect of the way that I'm living? And that's going to look different for each and every one of us leaving this place. Some of us, man, we, we're great at allowing God and His truth to flow in our forgiveness, but, man, we're, we're terrible at sharing His Word. Some of us are great at allowing the truth of God to flow through our finances, and some of us don't have the anger thing figured out. And so it, it looks different for each of us, but this week... Where does God's word need to begin to grow in us? As we wrap our services up, we also wanted to spend a minute just kind of having a crossroads discussion announcement a little bit. Uh, back a couple months ago, Leroy came to me and was like, hey, Matt, there's some things going on in our family uh, that maybe plays a part in kind of what things look like here at Crossroads. And uh, I, I want to take care of my family the best that I can. And so uh, we began to have those conversations. Uh, and then things kind of escalated for him in his home. Um, not in a sinful way, not in a bad way, uh, anything like that. Um, but just him taking care of his family and his kids uh, the best that he can, which is our first ministry. Um, and so when that kind of escalated, uh, Leroy and his family have actually moved out of the area. Uh, in order for him to take care of his family, uh, which has been hard for lots of different reasons, but uh, it's also been hard for him to continue to play the role that he uh, has been playing here uh, at the church. And so uh, we kind of had those conversations, navigated some of those things together. And so we want to let you know that Leroy is uh, transitioning in his role here at Crossroads. Uh, for the past almost four years, Leroy has uh, done worship and the media side, which is the videos you see, the website, social media, things like that. Um, and so in the immediate future, Leroy is transitioning to just doing the worship side of it. Um, and so we are <laughs> freeing him from all those other <laughs> responsibilities. Um, but also in our conversations, uh, Leroy, I mean, he said to us, we recognize together that, uh, that his position, it really requires someone being here in town and being uh, here full time. And uh, so part of this transition is the understanding that uh, as he takes care of his family, we are standing alongside of him in all of that. Um, but we're also going to begin the process of looking uh, as to who might step into his shoes. And uh, I know that that's, that's hard for all of us. Um, and But we also recognize that uh, what God is up to is way bigger than what we're up to. And so we're going to trust in that. Uh, we're going to stand alongside his family uh, and we're going to encourage them and pray for them. Uh, it has been a privilege uh, to be kind of uh, on the inside to see the way that our elders have responded to Leroy and his family uh, and just stood alongside of them and continued to do that. Um, but also we want to let you know kind of where it's at. There's some details of uh, Lori's situation, his story that we're not going to share. Uh, and that's not because it's a big secret. It's because it's his business. And we're just going to respect that like we would if it was our family. Uh, and we're going to love him through that the same. And so if you have questions, you can talk to me, talk to the elders, ask uh, Leroy, and he'll share as much as he can. But um, we just feel that this is best for him and his family to stand alongside them, but also us as a church moving forward. So I'm going to spend a minute praying for him and his family as well as uh, us as a church, and then we'll uh, finish singing together. Father in heaven, I am so thankful for my brother, my friend, uh, Father and his family. Father, for his courage. And his strength to lead his family first. Uh, Father, to love them and to take care of them in ways that would be hard for some of us too. And Father, to trust you um, in a very real and tangible way. Uh, Father, we just, God, I just bring him before you. Father, knowing that as he takes hard steps uh, of faithfulness with Shelby, uh, God, that there's lots of unknowns and there's lots of uncertainties, but he trusts in you. And he leans on you for uh, understanding far beyond what he has. Uh, Father, I pray that you will bring clarity 
uh, for their family. I pray that you will help them uh, just one day at a time. Remind them of your presence and your faithfulness. Father, we, we pray for this transition as us as a church, God, as we figure out what's next. And uh, God, I pray that you'll bring clarity to that as well. Father, that you will align the right people in the right places at the right time. God, we understand uh, that your kingdom's bigger than us and you have bigger plans. Uh, Father, we're thankful for seasons that we have together. Um, God, we're thankful for seasons apart where you do even more than we can ask or imagine. And Father, as we maybe begin to see that season ahead, uh, God, we trust that you will do more than we can ever ask or imagine. In this church, in Shelby and Leroy's family, Father, we pray that, that you will make clear your steps for all of us. Father, we're thankful that you created your church as a community to stand alongside to one another in really hard times, in uncertain times. Father, a community that is unlike anything else in this world. Father, we find strength in it, we find hope in it, and we find you in it. God, we're thankful for your goodness that we just sang about. Father, that you are good. And that we trust in that each and every day when we wake up and each and every day when we lay our heads down. Father, that in our families, in your church, you are good. You're faithful, you're true. And we have one another to help, to hold up. Father, to remind us of your goodness. Father, we're thankful for who you are. It's in your name we pray. Oh, you've done.